I don't want to blame all Berkeley students for the actions of a few, but the problem is this sort of mentality is spreading. Well, joining us now on the program, I'm pleased to welcome former assembly person from the state of California, Mike Gatto. I think he's going to be a statewide candidate for office soon, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, what are you running for now? Well, I haven't Mike? decided yet. I think politics is a little bit up in the air right now. Okay, so he's running for governor. So Mike Gatto <laughs> is, uh, is, is a longtime assembly person uh, from the state of California. He and I got into a Twitter spat the other day, and that's why I'm having him on. So I think a good place to start is with what's happening in Berkeley. What do you make of the, of the hubbub of the chaos? of What is a riot that happened in Berkeley last night? Well, first of all, I was in office when you were at Cal State LA last February, and I want to apologize. I want to start by apologizing on behalf of the state of California for what you went through. I appreciate it. Thank I mean, you. I mean, nobody should ever, when they're on a publicly funded campus that is paid for by taxpayer dollars, have to have their free speech quelled. Uh, you could argue maybe it's different on a private campus, but that was a public campus where people sought to clamp down on your free speech. The state of California owes you an apology. To the extent that I can do it for the, on behalf of the whole state, Well, thank I you. I appreciate yeah. it. And it's not your job to do it on behalf of the whole state, obviously. Right. I <laughs> you didn't do it. Uh, I, I only like to put responsibility where it lies, but, but I appreciate that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that the first place to start is that this is why I like having people who disagree on the show. I'm going to start doing this a lot more often now that we can have guests. Um, and uh, I think that that's fun because it's, it's fun to have the discussion and it's, it's really negative what happened last night. So what is, so I won't, let's, before we get to what we were spatting over on, on the internet, which was, which was a lot of fun, I, I do want to get to it because it's kind of a kick. Um, I, I, I want to ask uh, you, Assemblyman Gata, what do you make of how, the, how should the Democrats treat the accession of, of President Trump? So a lot of people seem to be going kind of nuts over this. Sure. What do you think is the best way for Democrats to, to deal with this? Because obviously, uh, I think that the sort of extreme rhetoric and tactics, not sure this is going to be productive. Correct. I was talking to a veteran uh, Democratic Congress member from D.C. Uh, yesterday, and he said, you know, think about it. Everything that Trump has done so far in office is designed to appeal to rural Pennsylvania and uh, rural Michigan, all the key areas of the swing states that Democrats lost. And then by lighting cars on fire in Berkeley, I'm not sure that we're going to win those hearts back. <laughs> well, I appreciate the honesty. And I think that, obviously, I think the Democratic Party could use more people like you in positions of power saying that because it seems like the Democratic Party is moving in a more extreme direction uh, by embracing some of the candidates they're talking about for the DNC chairmanship. There was that event a couple of weeks ago where the DNC chair candidates were saying things like, as white people, we have to sit down and shut up, and, and we have to we just have to listen to black people. It's my job to shut up the other white people up. That, that doesn't seem to me geared toward winning the white middle class voter in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, or Wisconsin. Uh, so, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about your, your broader worldview, because the reason that we, I invited you on in the first place right. is because we got into this fight, as I've referenced a couple of times on Twitter. And the reason that that came up is because I wrote a piece about uh, one, of the, one of the things that, a uh, talking point that folks on the left have been pushing for quite a while is this idea that the people at the very top of the income spectrum have way more money than everybody else, that people who are in the 1% own as much wealth as the rest of the world combined, that the top 60 people own as much wealth as, as 3.5 billion people. And basically, I wrote, so what, right? The people at the top, unless they stole it from the people at the bottom, why is this a problem? And I talked specifically about Bill Gates, who's now about to become the world's first trillionaire, apparently. Uh, and, uh, and I said, you know, there, there's hundreds of thousands of people who have worked for Microsoft. They create a product that millions of people buy and makes their businesses better. What what's the issue here? And you then proceeded to tweet this. Uh, so this is the tweet on feudalism. Uh, so your screed is a gross over. See, it's, it's so much more polite when we're in person. Your screed is a gross oversimplification too, akin to medieval mentality of kings and nobles protected us in battle. So nobility is awesome. <laughs> did I write that? I you did, did actually. Did. Sorry, sorry about that, Mike. But <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you'd like to explain where that comes from. Well, why do you think that? I, and I asked you, I asked you. So what makes Bill Gates a medieval feudal sure. lord? Well, first of all, I never gained as many Twitter followers, or I never got my 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 behind spanked as much as when I tried to troll you. So, <laughs> Your followers are very, very um, enthusiastic. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> um, but um, but the point I was trying to make is this. So I'm a traditionalist. I believe it or not, there's a democratic traditionalist. Um, I know that our founding fathers believed in small everything. They believed in small government. They believed in small concentrations of wealth. They thought that if we had the return of nobility in this country, that we'd be in a really bad place. We'd look like those countries in Europe that people had left. We would have this great concentration of power. It would start to seem like nobility, and that's what that reference was. And I do believe that there are times in history where the wealthy have more and they start to look like Russian oligarchs. And nobody would disagree that Russian oligarchs are kind of like nobility. They can control government. 
they have the power of life and death in certain towns and in certain provinces, and that's not good for our American way of value. Well, you I and I agree on the idea that oligarchy is bad, and obviously, right. but I'm not comparing Bill Gates to a Russian and oligarch. I'm not right? saying so, he is too, but but there is a saying that all great fortunes come from some crime, and you I don't know, think that's I don't think that's that's true though. Unless you can actually prove the crime, it's a little bit of a slander to, to suggest that, that people are are engaged in crime just because they're wealthy. There's, there's a lot of companies that when they start out, the regulations are not quite there yet, and they act in a regulatory vacuum, and in many cases, they're taking resources that you could argue belong to society, and they are exploiting them to their wealth. Well, unless you're talking about like people actually going into the commons and drilling for oil in areas that's not right. owned, for example, uh, then you know what, what resource do corporations like Google exploit or corporations like Microsoft exploit? It seems to me that their employees are some of the happiest people on the planet. It seems to us that you, know, you and I have great technology because of companies like this, and, and seeing wealth as an indicator, a red flag for something criminal has occurred, number one, sort of lets people who are poor off the, off the hook if they actually commit crime, and number two, says that wealthy people are actually the ones who are, who are criminals, when it seems to me that a lot of the people who are wealthy are wealthy specifically because they're engaging in lots of voluntary mutual transactions, which is the way our economy works. If it's not voluntary, you and I are on the same side, right? Sure. If, if, if somebody's actually exploiting somebody else, we don't disagree. But if, if somebody is not exploiting somebody, then what's the problem. Well, so you and I are both against the redistribution of wealth, but my point was there's many ways to redistribute it. So Rand Paul and Ron Paul both have said to audit the Fed, and I've supported yeah. that. I think the Federal Reserve, which is it's a quasi-governmental agency, it's appointed by the president, uh, the, the governors are appointed by the president, I think that their policies have favored those who own lots, lots of stocks and those who own lots of property. So are you in favor like, like, the, like the Pauls are of a return to the gold standard? You know, I think the gold standard for a long time served our country just fine. I'm actually in favor of return to the gold standard I, as well. You know, it's, it's real money, and it, it's tied to something that government can't create. So, so why I, are you a Democrat? I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, there are some Democratic traditionalists out there, and I think I am one of them. I mean, I think there's nothing wrong with being a small government Democrat, and I think there's also nothing wrong with saying that the Federal Reserve's policies have benefited those who own the, When you're lending money at next to nothing and you're inflating these bubbles, the people who tend to own those resources benefit from it. So in weird, in a weird way, that's a redistribution of wealth, too. No, I, I, I totally agree. It's redistribution of wealth by government. And, and, right. and as I say, I'm, I'm very libertarian on a lot of this stuff, and that is keep the government out unless somebody's yes. rights are actually being exploited. Now, I don't want to hit you over the head with your tweets, that's but fine. I'm going to hit you over the head with your tweets. So here's, so here's one more. Uh, this, is, this is you talking about inherited wealth. Uh, and again, things get dicey right. on Twitter in a way that they don't when we speak to each other. <laughs> face, face, right. says, I'm curious what the great-grandchildren of the wealthy invented, it to, uh, wealthy invented to deserve it. A smarter Ben Franklin railed against nobility. So the, the implication here seems to be that the founders were against inherited wealth. Benjamin Franklin did speak openly about the estate tax. He liked the Correct. idea of an estate tax because European nobility was not quite the same thing as American capitalism producing people who are wealthy. There's a mercantilist system in Europe where the government actually gave charters to specific friends of the government. It actually looks a lot more like what a presidents of both companies. stripes have been doing actually lately, right. where you know it looks like the green jobs program, or like Trump giving favors to a particular company, which it looks like corporatism. That's what old school sure. European nobility looked like. And in fact, Ben Franklin, when it came to his own distribution of wealth at his death, Ben Franklin actually handed virtually all of his wealth to his children. He gave a thousand pounds to the city of Philadelphia, a thousand pounds to the city of Boston, and that was it. Right. So he, it wasn't like he got he he liquidated all his wealth and said, "Kids, you're on your own." Right. Uh, so are you again? Are you in favor of the idea of a high estate tax taking lots of money away from people? people who have already been taxed on that money because we don't want their kids having it? So, so I do take, tend to take the Ben Franklin approach. Thomas Jefferson was more of an extremist on the estate tax. He didn't think that people should inherit much at all. Ben Franklin actually wrote that he thought that the average middle class person should be able to pass on their home, even two homes, three homes to their kids. But he did think that their really, really big estates should suffer some type of estate tax. And I think the middle class should not be subject to an estate tax, but I think the very, very, very wealthy, the high end, there should be some estate tax. Otherwise, you just run the risk of our society devolving into a bunch of Paris Hiltons. She's beautiful, she's talented, but you know, it was like her great grandfather founded something useful, and she didn't do much. And that's what that tweet was uh, was relating to. Well, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm no Paris Hilton fan, but I also right. don't think that I have the right to take away grandpa's wealth just because I don't want Paris Hilton to be doing Carl Jr. commercials. Yeah, but 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 that is a little bit of postmodern stuff that you might criticize if the left was saying it, because because. Government does have the right to draw lines. When we elect the government, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, we are saying, please draw the lines. 
I think an estate tax would be much more fair than an income tax. I, I think, I mean, don't forget. So do you want to remove the income tax? If you're in favor of removing yeah. the income tax Listen, in favor of a, our of a small estate tax, then our maybe country, I'm with you. Yeah, our country survived for the first 150 years on primarily three taxes. There was a sin tax. It was the whiskey tax, right? right? There, there was estate taxes and there was tariffs. Mm -hmm. And I think if we could come back to some sort of system where we re-looked at our tax code and said, hey, this is more fair. Uh, we're going to break up large estates. We're going to tax sins. And we're going to rely on some sort of uh, tariffs to, punitive, to, to penalize the worst abusers of slave labor in third world countries. I think that would be a better system than what we have now. Okay, that's that's interesting because you know, the, the, look, I think it's immoral to tax people twice. So if you're going to have an income tax and then you're going to steal money that I've already paid taxes sure. on, one of my, I mean, you, you have children, I assume. Yeah. I mean, is that how many kids do you have? I have two and a third on the way. Okay, sure. well, congratulations, yeah. that's exciting. So I have two under three, and the and one of the reasons that I work really hard is because I would like to pass on lots and lots of money to my children yes. so they don't have to work so hard, which is part and parcel of the American dream. Is not just I work hard, I get ahead. It's I work hard, and I get ahead, so my kids don't have to work quite as hard to get ahead. And when it comes to inherited wealth, I think there's this, this vast misnomer that the people who are the wealthiest in our society, all of them inherited their wealth. And actually, when you break it down, that's not really true. Like 35, according to, in 2012, there's the Forbes 400. And 35% of the, of the Forbes 400 was born poor or middle class. 22% were born upper middle class. So that means 57% were born either poor, middle class, or upper middle class. 11.5% inherited more than a million dollars. 7% inherited more than 50 million, so that would be Paris Hilton. Right. Uh, and 21% inherited enough money to just stay on the list, right? So, so that's- So tax the 7%. I mean, w when I got the tweets back from you, with, with our exchange from your followers. I mean, a lot of people said, hey, I'm just a middle class guy. Do you want to take my wealth? The answer is no. I do not want to take that wealth. I'm the same way. I work very hard so that my children will have a better life. And by the way, I, I'm not a career politician. I, I really have had jobs and I have a job <laughs> now and I'm working very hard. But, um, but I do think we do run this risk of returning to this, this era of nobility if we don't break up the vast, vast fortunes. It's that 7% or 6% you talked about. Yes, yeah, to me, I don't think that those fortunes should be broken up. I think the key is to protect the system itself so that, that those fortunes can't impact government. And that means you know, having a smaller government in total. Because the problem is once you get to the point where the government can confiscate a state wealth, you know that the government is so corrupt that there are going to be some estates that somehow escape and there's going to be some estates yeah, but, that but get they hit. they confiscate sales tax, they confiscate income tax, they confiscate so many things. We have to have tax. We have to pay for the crumbling roads in LA that are never paved. We have right, to pay why for Why punish the me just because I made a lot of money? Well, it's not punishing you because you made a lot of money. What, what it's trying I mean, it to sort do- sort of is. You're only hitting me if I'm really, really wealthy. Yeah, but I mean, that, listen, that's, that's, how, that's how a lot of tax codes are. I mean- I know they, they suck, yeah. Well, they do, they do. They do. But, but, <laughs> but if you think about it, the, the wealthy guy who buys a Rolls Royce, he pays more in sales tax than, than someone like me who doesn't own a car. Right, but he has a choice to buy that car, right? I mean, right. It, that, right. That's, a little bit, that's a little bit different. Now you're talking yeah. about, you just look at the bottom line and you say, okay, you made more than seven million, you made you know, two million, the seven million guy- Maybe you cut it off at a billion dollars, but, but the point is, I just think I'm a traditionalist, and I think our founding fathers believed in this system, which was, yeah, you know, you let the you let the person pass on three, four, five houses to their kids. That's fine. You let them pass on their cars and their bank accounts. But maybe the person who starts to look like a Russian oligarch because they've got so much power and so much money, we probably don't want that in America. And by the way, this type of this type of people ignoring this, politicians in power ignoring this for so long, is why Donald Trump won all these Midwestern states, is because he actually talked to people and said, look, I'm going to try to return good jobs to, to your class. Uh, I think that's right. I think it's also, I think it's ironic that you cite Donald Trump as an example of that, because Donald Trump is actually part of that 7% yes, 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 a crap load Donald of money. Trump. My God, <laughs> so, Donald Trump. All right, well, I th thank you so much for stopping by. It really is a pleasure to have you, and, uh, and it's always fun to have a cordial conversation with somebody with whom I disagree. So thank you for, for the time, and thanks for coming in. Thank you, Mike Gatta. Thank you. And look out for him. He's going to run for governor, even though he says he's just considering it. So make sure that you keep an eye on that. Well, what we have to say, thank you.